And welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. This is Lori LeBay, and I'm the host and founder of Alzheimer Speaks. For those of you that are new to us, I'll just take a minute here and explain a little bit about Alzheimer Speaks. Basically, we're an advocacy based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. And we believe that by sharing knowledge and joining forces, And having conversations like we're going to do today, that we're going to be able to remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help those who are diagnosed continue to live with purpose. Together, we can give everyone a true understanding of the needs of this disease for both those diagnosed and those caring for them. At our core, Alzheimer Speaks believes collaboration is the only way we're going to win this battle. And I know it's working because of all of your likes and clicks and shares of our resources. You see, you had a huge impact on getting Alzheimer's Speaks um, recognized as the number one influencer online for um, Alzheimer's regarding, uh, or regarding Alzheimer's, according to Share Care and Dr. Oz. And again, that was just you sitting and listening um, to our radio and then sharing it with your Facebook friends, your Twitter tribe, your LinkedIn colleagues, your um, Pinterest people. And just pushing that out there. Or maybe it was our blog and you liked an article. Maybe it was our Dementia Chats webinars where our experts um, have conversations and our experts all have dementia. Or our Conscious Caring Resources uh, where we interview businesses and um, people living with dementia um, and those caring for them as well in a video format. So um, while you're listening to us today, you might be thinking, gosh, you know, I got a story to tell. I have a a service, a product, a tool that I think could help others. Um, Please reach out to me. Just go to alzheimerspeaks.com, and at the top there's a big contact button, and you can either shoot me an email or you can give me a holler. I would love to talk with you about being a next guest on our show. Now, before we um, start talking about our topic today, which is all about abuse and dementia, um, I want to give a shout out to Good Samaritan Society, and they have a brand new program for uh, caregivers, um, and it's a life coaching for caregivers, and it's totally free. And um, this is just an amazing um, free service uh, that they are able to offer through a grant. It's for Minnesota only, so sorry, other states and countries. Um, But let's see what happens here in Minnesota. Maybe this can get expanded. You can call 605-679-1765. That's 605-679-1765. Or you can email care.coach at good... um, sam.com that's care.coach at goodsam.com and we are actually going to have them on next week so um, if you have questions or um, just want to learn more about that program make sure you turn in uh, to the program next week let's get going and um, introduce our guest today he is so dear to my heart I have worked with Harry pretty much virtually for many many years now Um, Harry Urban actually lives in Pennsylvania, and he was diagnosed with dementia, probably of the Alzheimer's type, about 12 years ago. And he founded a dementia support group on Facebook called Forget Me Not. He also started United Against Dementia, which is a brand new initiative. And he has this fabulous blog called MyThoughtsOnDementia.com. Again, that's MyThoughtsOnDementia.com. So welcome, Harry. Thank you, Lori. Uh, thank you for having me. This is a this is a topic that is so dear to us, and it's very very seldom talked about. So I am so glad to be here and able to speak about it. Well, I am thrilled to have you. Um, Harry is one of our experts on dementia chats, and 
We just love having him on because he he looks at the pros and the cons um, from from all angles, and he is so well connected in the dementia community around the world. and And so this conversation is going to be, I, I think, something that's going to really, you know, not only pull at your heartstrings, um, but it's really going to make you think on how you give and receive care and what abuse really is. So, Harry, first, do you want to kind of define how you view elder abuse? Sure. Uh, now, when I when I look at elder abuse, um, I look through the eyes of someone living with dementia. So, of course, I look at abuse in, in uh, nursing facilities and home and things like that. But abuse happens to elders all around. Each year, hundreds of thousands of older persons are abused, neglected, and exploited. Now, many of these victims are people that are older, frail, vulnerable, and they just can't help themselves, and they depend on others to meet them the most basic of needs. Now, abusers, or both women and men, they may be family members, friends, or trusted others. Anybody that um, is caring for somebody may be or could be an abuser. Now, the, the problem with, with being abused is uh, it becomes a way of life. You don't know you're being abused because it, it is your life. Mm-hmm. Very true. Very, very true. And um, especially when dementia comes into play, it just complicates things so much because of trust levels and, um, you know, who are you and where do you fit into the scheme of things and and, um, trust levels and things. So I think it's really important for people to understand this and and appreciate this. And, um, you know, abuse can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be financial, um, psychological. I mean, there's so many different variables out there and and a lot of times it's multiple types of abuse that can be um you know coming into play um one of the questions i wanted to ask you harry were you personally affected by elder abuse i've been i've been affected by abuse i think from the day i was diagnosed now um when when you think of abuse most people think of physical abuse but um, it, it's much more than that. The emotional abuse is what is the most terrible thing for us. Now, every time somebody asks me, uh, like if I'm, if I'm speaking someplace, somebody always comes up and asks me, Harry, are you sure you have dementia? Now, you have to look at it through my eyes. That's a form of abuse. Mm-hmm. Because that's forcing me to um, go over the facts of why I'm standing up there and why I'm talking about this. Of course I do. They always plant the seeds when they say that, and they give me the doubt. Well, maybe I don't have I don't have dementia. Uh, and then that's a horrible thing when you have to relive every single day of being told, reminded that you have dementia. Now, in my case, um, unfortunately, uh, you I went through the abuse of abandonment from family members, friends, and things like that. Uh, but most recently, uh, I've been uh, going through the abuse of exploitation. In other words, um, I've I've had cases where um, family members might think they they have the right to claim stuff because I have dementia. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it got so bad with me that um, I had I had uh, uh, things said like like he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, we have proof that he's incompetent. Mm-hmm. Uh, one day. Uh, a policeman came to my door a couple of several weeks ago, and uh, it had to do with the um, uh, selling some some equipment off of a of a business I had. Mm-hmm. And 
um, number one, I had to have a letter of competency that what I'm saying is 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 true. Okay, that's one thing I had to prove. Uh, the second thing I had to prove was was the equipment was legally mine, and the business I was the sole proprietor of the business, and the equipment was being sold off on the pretense that um, I'm incapable of of selling it because mm-hmm. the business is now is now out of business. But anyway. Um, it's it's not a simple thing now of just saying, hey, stop doing that. We have to go to court. It's now a legal it's now a legal uh, action. Uh, we have to go to court. Now, in my eyes, that's good and bad. In, in my eyes, going to going to court is going to be a very traumatic thing for me mm-hmm. uh, because I have to I have to prove without a shadow of a doubt that I am right. Uh-huh. Uh, but if I don't go to court, it will never end. And that's that's the bad thing with, with any kind of abuse. Unless you take a stand and stop it, it's never going to stop. Mm-hmm. And most people are not strong enough to stand up to it and stop it. They just let it go. But... Uh, you know me, I'm not going to let that go by, and I'm going to have the opportunity, and I'm going to say and do what I need to do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when your equipment was sold, was it you that sold it, or was it actually someone else trying to sell it out from underneath you? I'm a little confused on that. Well, the, one, of the, one of the worst things you can do is, is uh, and, and we're all guilty of it, is... When you have a child, you name them after yourself. Mm-hmm. So you, 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 your siblings or whatever um, might have the same name as you do. Mm-hmm. Well, when, when equipment's being sold, um, they, they can represent, they can re- represent me okay. because they have the same name. And nobody knows it until something happens. Okay. And then, of course, um, somebody always gets upset about that. And in this case, this is what happened. Uh, some equipment was sold, and I, and I didn't even know it was sold. And there was a uh, there was a problem with getting titles transferred and everything because naturally they were in my name, mm-hmm. even though somebody else might have a have a similar name. They couldn't get the title chain, so so there was a problem with that, and that's what led into me being involved in all this stuff being sold off, which I didn't know about. Now, you have to you have to understand when I retired, uh, all my life savings went into the business, mm-hmm. and hindsight says, Harry, that was dumb, but um, I didn't know any better. So anyway. When the when the business folded up, I more or less thought to myself, "Well, I lost everything." You know, now the business the business folded up not through my neglect, mm-hmm. but through neglect of the business. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always had the idea, why well, I, I still had the I still had the business to sell off that I could get a return on my money, but. That's that's the last thing on my mind when what I have to venture, you know. I'm I'm just trying to stay alive. Mm-hmm. So when things started being sold off, I didn't even think about it because that's not high in my priority, and I never I never viewed it as being dishonest mm-hmm. until I got back into the wall up up to the wall and and there was a policeman at my door, and he was. He was trying to find out what was going on. Mm-hmm. Well, you know that that's that's the scary part of it is because uh, now I'm forced to I'm forced to do things I really don't want to do, mm-hmm. but I have to stop it. And, and and that's a bad thing about about abuse because too many people get hurt by it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's that's very true. That's very true. That that had to be um, difficult for your for your wife as well, I would think. Yeah, yeah, it uh, it, it it completely shattered the family. Uh, now, I get very little I get very little support from my family, from my own personal family. Now, I have I have uh, I have one daughter that is I couldn't ask for a better a better person to walk with me, but but the uh, but the rest of them uh, they just kind of walked away from it, mm-hmm. uh, and that's probably the worst abandonment that we can ever feel. Yeah, and and people don't really see that as abuse when people walk out of their out of somebody's life, but that's just heart wrenching. That's just the the core of who we are and feeling like we belong and have purpose and and all of those things. And, you know, I don't think that that people really understand the effect that that can have, you know, for people in, uh, you know, as a whole. That's for sure. There there are so many different types of of, of neglect that, uh, that people don't even know about it. And, and they have to they have to get to know about this uh, now here's here's some examples of uh, nursing home neglect mm-hmm. um, there's the, uh, the there's the emotional abuse and neglect and this may be uh, uh, humiliation uh, ridicule threats things of that nature in a in a nursing facility uh, there's sexual abuse and that's not that's Unwanted, unsensual sexual acts against another resident—that's that's rampant in, in nursing facility. There's there's physical abuse um, that might include scratching, biting, punching, uh, even unnecessary restraints. That's a form of abuse. Personal hygiene and basic needs. Um, when somebody is uh, denied apps, stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, and things like that, if, if they're denied uh, a, a safe, clean environment, that's abuse. Medical abuse um, might include uh, not getting proper medication or, re- or reporting issues like, like bed sores. Um, so many times you visit your loved one in a nursing facility and they have bed sores. And the first question you ask is, has this been reported? And most times the answer is no. Mm-hmm. You know, the staff doesn't report it. So that that's abuse. Um, like I said, abandonment, the emotional abuse is, is probably one of the hardest mm-hmm. things like that. Um, there, there's so many different types of abuse, and people don't think of it as being abusive until until you spell it out. It, you know, like a lot of times is, is if somebody is constantly being yelled at, let's say, or, and, well, I didn't mean that. Mm-hmm. You know, well, that's okay for the person talking, but from the person on the receiving end, that's abuse. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it it really is. Um, what um, you know, you've you've given some examples. If you are, uh, what are some signs for a person to watch out? Let's say somebody who has dementia. What should they be looking for? What should their family be looking for to protect there, them? There's all there, there's all different hap- there's all different signs you have to be aware of. Uh, any open wounds or bed sores. That's that's a sign of abuse. Um, extreme weight loss. Now, <clears throat> we all go through weight loss through medication and the illness, but um, if there's extreme weight loss, you have to question, is my mother or father eating? Mm-hmm. You know, things like that. Uh, dehydration. That's another, that's another sign, a, a warning sign. Chronic infections. Um, nursing nursing facilities have had that type of problem. 
disappearance of personal items. Mm-hmm. Now, if you if you're living in a in a care facility, a lot of times um, you might go in and say, uh, "Hey, Dad, what's your watch?" He said, "I don't know. I haven't seen it for a couple of days." Well, that that's a warning sign that that somebody might be taking his personal property. Um, a big one is is unaccounted depletion of funds. Mm-hmm. That's something that that uh, family members might take notice of it, but a lot of times family members are the cause of it. But all of a sudden, if if there's no money for something, or uh, a lot of times people want to take money into a nursing facility and say, uh, here's some money uh, for whatever. Mm-hmm. And next thing you know, it's gone because another resident might take it. Mm-hmm. And that's a sad, that's a sad fact of life. I mean, it happens all the time. Yeah, I know when my mom was in the nursing home and my dad both, I mean, we we got to the point where we decided to, um, you know, with mom's jewelry, it just wasn't safe, um, you know, to be there anymore. And because she couldn't track it and... Things were starting to to wander off different different things, and um, so we pulled that back. And you know, Dad always wanted money, but again, got to the point where he really couldn't track it, so it didn't make sense um, to be able to have that to keep him, you know, open to potential abuse. I mean, we want to block that any time that we can um, with things, and and I think that that's that's really important and. I think a lot of times, too, it's um, family members or um, people that are really close that can be the abusers, and people forget that, and they don't really want to they don't really want to think about that happening. Uh, but a lot of times the abusers are known. That is that anyways, that's what I have learned um, in talking with people. Have you heard the same thing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a, a couple of other things that you may want to watch out for for abuse in in a, in, a, in a nursing facility is if you have a, a delayed access to your loved ones or a refusal for a staff member to leave while you're visiting, mm-hmm. that's another red flag that comes up that that um, like they say I'm. I'm here to visit mom. And they say, well, <clears throat> can you have a seat and wait a little bit? You know, it's for one reason or another. Well, th- there may be times when when maybe mom's getting a bath or something like that, but but that's a little red flag that comes up that, that should make you think. Um, if, um, if, if your loved one is fearful of a staff member, or something like that, or fearful of another resident, uh, that's another warning sign that, that you have to pick up on um, that maybe maybe they're having problems with the resident and they're not telling the staff about it. Mm-hmm. And if, if there's a lot of mood swings or signs of depression, uh, they don't want to do anything, things, things of that sort, there, there's a problem there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to you have to put your hat on and do a little detective work and find out what the problem is. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, now, in talking, because you, you talk with so many people, you know, all over the world, um, do you hear stories of various types of abuse from people? Do they open up about that? They. I, I find now people will talk to me about it, and when I ask them, "Have you told anybody else?" they almost always say no. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's that's a that's a little that's a little secret that nobody wants to talk about. Nobody wants to say, "Hey, I'm getting abused." Mm-hmm. But but when, once you once you talk to enough people like that. You you pick up body languages. You know there's a problem. Now you you may not know what the problem is, and you're not looking for a problem, but you something just sticks out in your mind that, that hey, this needs investigation. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, somebody has to be told about this. Um, and a lot of times, um, residents won't go to to the staff to complain about the staff because they're afraid of of what might happen. Mm-hmm. So they don't they don't do it. Um, now I'm not saying that the staff is the problem. I, I think most of the abuse problem occurs because of the residents, and it, it occurs because of the of the type of illness with dementia. A lot of times the residents don't even know they're abusing somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like that. But um, I just wish people would would open up a little bit more and 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 talk about it. Now, whenever we have a memory cafe or things like that, that that's that's one of the topics I love bringing up about abuse. And not that I'm looking for problems, but I'm I'm trying to give people the avenue, the platform that they can they can talk about their their abuse. And um, it it it's funny. <laughs> most most abuse you hear about is just minor stuff. You don't. You don't ever hear about the emotional abuse, mm-hmm. you know, things things like that. You you might you might hear the uh, the abuse of well, she's always coming into my room, or or uh, uh, somebody's taking my somebody's taking my things, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. And, and you have to wonder is that abuse or are they just misplacing it? You know, so there's a lot of you can't just say everything is abuse. You have to kind of, you know, check it out. Mm-hmm. It, you know, especially when it comes to dementia, because there was a lot of times when my, you know, it was my mom not remembering things correctly. Um, and um, it, and it wasn't that anybody was doing anything wrong, you know, staff-wise, or she just didn't always understand um, maybe the process or why somebody had shown up or why they took her clothes. You know, they were to wash them, um, not to steal them. And um, so I, th- I think you're right. It, it has to be it has to be looked at seriously um, in terms of of what's going on, you know, with things. So that's um, that's a good thing to to bring up there. Um, what have you found in terms of of um, in terms of people and, you know, their comments, um, you know, regarding abuse, um, do they do they go outside? Do they talk about it? I, I mean, you know, in Forget Me Nots, you're, you're a pretty safe place for people to be able to be. But, um, you know, where do you recommend that they go for help um, if, they're, if they're worried? Well, first of all, a lot of people, a lot of people are willing to talk about it, but very few people are willing to do anything about it. Um, they don't want to get involved in it because they might be wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, they might be wrong in the accusation. So what? What they do? They don't do anything. But um, if you think if you think anybody is in any kind of a danger, call nine one one or the local police for help. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if the danger is in immediate, but you just suspect somebody, talk to somebody. You know, now, like I said, a lot of people don't, they refuse to talk to the staff uh, because they're, they're worried about what might happen to mom or dad, sister, brother, whatever, that's in the, living in a nursing facility. But there's other people you could talk to. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you want to report elder abuse, contact the Adult Protection or Protective Services Services Agency. Every state has one. And um, if you talk to them, they can guide you. Mm-hmm. They can give you steps that that uh, make sure that that um, it is abuse. And if it is abuse, they will check it out and they will correct it. Okay. Now, we've got a, a chat in the box here from, from Brian LeBlanc, and he said his father thought that the caretaker um, that came to his house was stealing from him, and I think that's a really common thing. Um, 
is paranoia with stealing and is that is that accurate or not and you can't always take it um you know for for the words that are stated because there can be some hallucinations and and things that are going on sometimes with with dementia um and Ryan just noted that his dad had vascular dementia. And then Victoria is um, asking, she said, you know, where do we start in helping uh, clarify human and civil rights surrounding dementia? Do you think the first responders are being given adequate training on how to handle dementia situations? And um, Harry, I'm going to let you answer that first, and um, we'll go from there. But where do you think we need to start with clarifying human and civil rights regarding dementia? I think I think first of all we have to know what they are. Mm-hmm. We have to know what our what our rights are before we can defend them. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as far as do I think first responders in my area they are not. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's so many times when the uh, uh, when the police now this is this is nationwide now where the police they. Um, they get into a confrontation, and <clears throat> it gets escalated before before it even should be, mm-hmm. because they didn't know how to handle it. And even though the the person with dementia could be in the clear, could be innocent of anything, but they might react violently because of what they perceive. Mm-hmm. And that that's one of the things that that the the uh, the program that Gary is is uh, is doing now with training first responders, I think it's wonderful, but it's not enough. We have to expand that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that concept has to be in every city, every state, every town. That training has to be done. People has to learn uh, how to deal with somebody with dementia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I definitely agree. And you're talking about Gary LeBlanc, who has done a wristband program for hospitals and is doing uh, EMT work as well, um, which has been amazing. And there's there's lots of others popping up doing this work as well. Um, But it's not near to the point that it needs to be. Um, And I, I found that out just working with various cities throughout the country. People think that they have a method, and then when you start asking questions they really realize um, how much is lacking. And um, one of the things that I found from the police and, and the EMTs was they said, you know, we, we start out with kind of our basic medical concerns is somebody having a heart attack or stroke, you know, and they kind of go weed down. And then, um, and then they go in and a lot of times we'll dump the person off at the hospital and then the hospital starts all over again. And there's not a good communication system at all when it comes to dealing with somebody with... Um, with dementia, and because that is so stressful to keep having to go through the same things over and over and over again, or getting incorrect information and then, but you know, thinking that that's accurate, um, you know, there can be a lot of time, precious time lost, and um, energy put in a in an area that where it really truly isn't needed at times. So I, I agree that education is is super super important. And um, we'd like to see all cities get on board with that. Now, um, as far as, you know, clarifying kind of the human and civil rights surrounding dementia, I think some of that is starting to change with the dementia-friendly communities that you're seeing pop up there. And there's there's uh, large organizations and then there's grassroots efforts um, that are all trying to define, you know, what is this? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the the civil rights and human rights that you feel have kind of gotten squashed once a diagnosis comes and that's questionable that you've run into personally? Some, some of the things that, that I see is, um, I kind of mentioned it before that, uh, number one, <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as somebody finds out that I was diagnosed with dementia, they don't want to talk to me. Mm-hmm. Okay, they they want they want somebody else to tell my story. Like if I was involved in something, uh, they won't ask me what happened. They ask somebody else what happened, mm-hmm. and that that is that is so unfair to me. Uh, simple things. I 
again, it's like like um, police have the have the right to put handcuffs on me if they think I'm a danger to myself or to somebody else with mm-hmm. safety for themselves. But I can tell you what would happen if they would try to put handcuffs on me. Mm-hmm. Um, I would be so combative. It was, it's, it's just a reflex. It's just a... It's just a, a fear I have and things like that, even though um, it, if they would just learn how to handle it differently, they could avoid that problem. But things like that, um, there, there's so many other violations. I mean, I, I I don't even know where to begin talking about it. And, you know, when you talk about dementia friendly, um, the, the first thing people talk about is making some place handicap accessible. Mm-hmm. Well, that is not dementia friendly. Mm-hmm. You know, th- things is is dementia friendly to me is, is 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 making making life easier for us. Now, yeah, if, if I don't have to step a, up a step to to cross the street, um, that's nice, but that's not dementia friendly. Mm-hmm. So, what would you say dementia friendly is? Um, there, there's so many things. Dementia friendly is is uh, me being able to go into a store and um, find something when I'm confused. Okay, not not just giving me verbal directions on how to get something, uh, find something. Um, being dementia friendly is the cashier showing a little patience when I'm. When I'm standing there trying to pay for uh, a purchase and I'm struggling with the money, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm struggling trying to find out what's going on. Um, dementia friendly is, is the guy standing behind me when I'm confused and I'm not going fast enough or whatever, and they want to check out, they want to go, so they always get irritated, you know, things like that. I think dementia friendly is just making our life easier now i'm not saying i'm not saying catering in us or anything like that but but to understand the problem we have and find ways to get around it yeah well and what i have found is that pretty much anything you do to be dementia friendly is friendly to everybody i mean it's not you know it's not going to be a detriment to another population by any stretch it's just uh Mm -hmm. It's a helpful resource for everyone because it. I think it makes us slow down, really pay attention to you know what is going on right now, um, and um, and look deeper for answers because everybody is reacting for a reason. You know the way they are, and we we've, we've turned into kind of a paranoid society. And if somebody is acting what we feel is out of line, then they're bad. You know, there's this good and this bad side. And there's a lot of gray in between there. And um, we've lost we've lost the graciousness and the compassion to figure out what that gray matter is and, and how to deal with it. Um, now, Brian is talking about, you know, with Dementia Friendly, he's just talking about removing stigma, you know. And um, Jane Moore has noted, she says there's times where she's had to enlighten the nurse or the general practitioner that her mother was even in the room, you know, talk to her, be inclusive. And we're not inclusive. You know, we kind of get on these paths. Um, Brian also has mentioned that he um, has done some work in terms of training law enforcement officers um, down in the, the panhandle area. And he says it's called crisis intervention training. That's exactly what it is. And they're trained to recognize and deal with individuals with dementia-related illnesses. Yet um, Victoria um, Doyle has said that, um, she says, our local EMTs are trained to identify dementia, but not how to manage or de-escalate situations, which is critical, you know, because you can identify something, but if you can't help the situation, you're really kind of right back to where you were to begin with, other than you've put a name to it now. And so I, I agree, um, we need a lot more training and a lot more, I think a lot more conversation like this to get people to realize um, how 
how whacked things can get. I mean, if somebody put me in handcuffs, I wouldn't be happy either. But if you, if I had dementia on top of it and didn't understand the process, I can't even imagine how frightened I'd be. I, I just, I can't even, I can't even fathom that. And I, I would be, I think, like you, Harry, you'd be like, look out, because I'm coming to get you, because <laughs> I'm not liking this and not understanding it. And so now, instead of de-escalating, we've just raised the bar in terms of how crazy can I be, <laughs> because you're going to find out. Um, because I'll the- give another example. Um, le- last year, uh, my wife, Hazel, uh, her, her office is at the corner of a, of a of a, a corner that has traffic lights there, mm-hmm. and it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty busy intersection, and she just happened to look out and there was a there was a backup of traffic, and there was this this gentleman, um, this older gentleman. He was up at the traffic light, but he wouldn't move, mm-hmm. and there was people yelling at him, beeping the horn for him to go and stuff like that, and he just sat there. And uh, my wife is, well, she's very sensitive to that kind of stuff. And it just so happened that a policeman came by, and they were they were all set to break out the window to get this man out. Mm-hmm. And he he was just he was just locked in there, and he wouldn't he wouldn't move, he wouldn't do anything. So uh, Hazel went out, and she went up to the policeman and they asked, "Could I talk to him?" And he said, "Yeah." And she went over and she casually talked to him, got him to wind the window down and things like that and unlock the door. And she was able to defuse the whole situation. Wow. And it ended up to be a wonderful story. But if, if the crowd would have had their wishes, the policeman would have broke the window in and drug that poor man out. Oh, I, I just can't even fathom that, how upset I would be if that was my parent being treated like that. You know, I just yes, yes. very that's very. That's not spooky. unusual. Mm-hmm. That is not unusual. Yes. Yeah, I I believe that. Um, Victoria is saying um, that she's trying to get something like the training going on that that um, Brian is doing up in her area, but it's been tough to sell. She says, "I'm just trying to get ahead of it before we have a tragedy to respond to," which is. Which is really true because we hear about these tragic situations all the time. Um, we had a, a situation um, here in Minnesota, and actually it was with uh, one of our members' husbands from our memory cafe who didn't drive, and he went out and drove, um, took the car, hadn't driven for over five years, and was gone for, gosh, almost eight hours he ended up running out of gas, and um, some construction workers helped fill his tank, not knowing that there was anything wrong, you know, because they were just trying to be good citizens, and he seemed okay. And then he ended up getting on the freeway, driving the wrong way down the freeway. Now, there wasn't an accident, and um, it was reported, and, you know, they got him back home safely. But, boy, that could have been horrendous. So I think even for us as individuals, Sometimes when we think we're doing the right thing, it's not always the right thing to do because we don't have all yes. the information. And um, to be to be really careful and conscious, you know, with that um, is is extremely extremely important. Um, you know, in 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 terms of the dementia friendly movement, one of the things that I haven't heard them talk about a whole heck of a lot is abuse you know, in the situations and how, how is that to be dealt with? I, I think the focus right now that I've, that I have heard around our nation here has been um, more to create that, what they consider a safe, um, comfortable environment, but it really doesn't go to the depths of removing abuse. Um, and I, and I think that that is something that needs to be tackled. We need to be able to track people who um, do this for their business um, target the elderly, and um, we've seen that in, you know, different communities where they move from one community to another as a worker and will abuse staff, um, stealing money or physical abuse, whatever it might be. Same in the home care um, industry that has happened, this financial industry. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And yet the the 
major people who are the abusers are typically family and friends. But those that are employed, we should be able to track those and, um, you know, squish them out and, and penalize them for, for their wrongdoings instead of just allowing them to move to another state or another county. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I think that that's something that really needs to be looked at seriously. And I know there's more chatter about it, but I haven't seen a lot of improvement per se, policy-wise, um, you know, to to share knowledge and cross those county and state lines. And I, and I think that, that that is something that, that needs to happen. What are your thoughts on that, Harry? I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think a lot of times, uh, now I, I can speak, I can speak from experience that um, there's no punishment for abusing you. Not, none, none at all. Now, if, if it's physical abuse, yes, there is. Mm-hmm. But um, there's no punishment for any other types of abuse, emotional abuse or things like that. Uh, people just just do it. Uh, mm-hmm. They're told stop, and they may stop for a while, but they will continue. Like um, verbally being a, a abusive to somebody, somebody they're caring for. You can't stop that. There's no punishment. There's no deterrent to, to force somebody to stop. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't say, um, you got to be nice. You know, people don't understand that. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it's really, it's really, um, I'm at the point, I'm looking at it through the hopeless eyes again, mm-hmm. that, that nobody is out there. Nobody is willing to take a stand and say, yes, we have to do something about this. This has to stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's hard. It, you know, if I had the answers, I'd certainly presume. But I don't. You know, I don't know what to do. Uh, because the damage is done uh, as you're speaking the words. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, how can you stop that? You can't stop that. Yeah, and it's it's very hard because that that emotional abuse is so embedded in people, mm-hmm. and um, you know that's it's not you know um, a scratch or a cut you know or even a broken leg and that heals, um, but those emotional scars are really that's a tough tough piece to deal with, um, and um, you know not that those scars don't show. Um, but they don't always touch the heart and the mind um, the way some of the others do, you know, with the, the emotional abuse and psychological abuse that, that people run into. Um, Brian has noted here that the Dementia Care and Cure Initiative statewide task force here in Florida, which he's now a member of, trains individuals um, and um, banks and grocery stores and malls, big and small companies to be dementia friendly. And it's their goal to make uh, Florida a dementia friendly state, which would be absolutely wonderful to do. And, um, and we're seeing more and more excitement wrapped around that, which I think all will help in terms of, of helping to remove and, um, and even identify when abuse occurs because it, it's definitely happening out there. And, um, you know, we need to we need to be able to deal with it on a on a better level and have a better process um, for people to follow and just even feel like the door is open um, to them when they, when they have so an many issue. times. Uh, uh, speaking of dementia friendly, so many times uh, little towns and stuff they 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 try to be uh, become dementia friendly, and maybe in the in the Town square, whatever they put benches, mm-hmm. and uh, and and they and they think, okay, now this is going to be a nice place for uh, people with dementia to come sit, look at the birds, whatever. Um, but it's also a nice hangout for homeless. Mm-hmm. And now now businesses are saying uh, they're calling the police and they're saying, hey, uh, that person's been out there for a couple of hours sitting on the bench or to uh, preventing in a or they're, they're hindering the, the business by business, you know, and 
and the police come along and uh, and, and tell them they have to move along. Mm-hmm. You know, things like that. So it it it's a very very hard thing of being dementia friendly. Now we all we all think about that. And we all say, my my goodness, it would be so easy to do. Let's do it. But but the problems with it is is so much. Because number one, like we all talked about, nobody knows what dementia friendly is because it means different things to different people. And uh, until until we just sit down and start talking about it, getting ideas instead of everybody trying to find their own dementia-friendly city, um, it's never going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I don't know what your thoughts are, you know, about defining what dementia-friendly is. I know that there's a lot of people out there that want to kind of put it in a box and say you have to do A, B, C, and D. Right in order to be dementia friendly. Um, and, and I, I, I personally, I don't, I don't like that because I think every community is different and I think we'll lose a lot of creativity and passion if we kind of make it a bed in a bag type thing. But what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you, you have to, I, I think you're right. Every town, every village, every thing, it means something different to them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think, I think you have to be smart enough to find out what's going to work. It's the same thing with, with memory cafes. There's tons of different forms, types of memory cafes. Uh, the ones I run are very successful, but they may not be what your community wants. Mm-hmm. So you almost have to, you almost have to build dementia friendly around, around your town, your culture, you know, things like that. Yeah, I, I think people have to be able to utilize um, the skills and the tools that are available to them in their in their own area. And um, that's one of the things that, that scares me sometimes is if we say there's only one way to do it, um, I mean, I've seen just such creative ways that people are going about making a huge, huge difference. And, um, and I'd hate to see that stop, that creativity stop. Um, because I, I do personally believe that it's the passion behind any initiative that that makes it successful. Um, it's not necessarily how much money you throw at it, um, but it's the people behind it that really believe in it and um, and get excited, you know, to have others um, believe in it as well. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat box here again, and um, Jane is saying that businesses and shops must also be aware that the carer or family members need support too when working together in a dementia-friendly community, which is really true. I know we've had lots of discussions just about family bathrooms versus men and women bathrooms and that they're not just for um, families with small children that need their diapers changed, you know, um, or in the process Mm -hmm. of being potty trained, but that they're really effective for um, people who are caring for someone who might need some assistance. Um, you know, or even just comfort, just having somebody there so that they're not in that, in that room alone as well. Um, so that's interesting. Um, Jane is actually from the UK and she says her mother, um, she says here in the UK, my mother missed me in seconds when she would, you know, go get some hairspray for a moment. And, um, and that staff was immediately by her side showing her where she was and, you know, what a comfort that would be. She said she was really thankful for the help, you know, that day. And um, that alleviated her mom getting upset, you know, and that was just so valuable to her as a, as a carer or over here in the U.S. We call them care partners or caregivers. Um, but, you know, all of that, it, it's, it's about working as a team together. Um, to create a comfortable, a, a, com- a comfortable environment, no matter where that is, if it's at home, um, or if it's in a community, or if it's in a day program, or if you're out in the community as a whole, you know, having dinner or going to the hardware store or grocery store or bank, um, and just making sure that people feel like they fit and are valued and. I think we've gotten away from that, not just with dementia, but with people in general. You know, we we don't even talk to people live anymore. It's it's texting, it's emailing. Um, we use minimal contact. Um, 
I, I'm fearful that our kids are are not learning the skills of nonverbal communication, which is over three quarters of our communication nowadays. And that's one of, to me, one of the keys when dealing with dementia is tapping into those nonverbals. I think that's one of the things that we have to train, um, you know, the police and the fire and the EMTs um, and so many others on. It's that it doesn't always come out in words, you know. It could just be a look, you know, um, that someone is expressing. And we're, we're ignoring some of those things. Um, well, I can't believe how fast this hour has gone, Harry. This is a, <laughs> a very interesting topic, but it always is with you. And again, we just, we just barely touched on it. And again, some of the types of abuse that Harry had mentioned was anything from sexual to physical abuse to verbal, emotional, um, psychological abuse, financial abuse. And then we get into the neglect areas, too, where, you know, maybe somebody's not getting the proper meds or um, reporting isn't being done the way it should to make sure that that somebody is tracking um, how someone is being cared for um, or just being able to live in a clean, safe environment. I mean, how huge is that? Um, it, it's so critically important. So the list kind of goes on and on, and we all have to open our eyes up a little bit more. Um, to assure that um, our elders are safe, and especially those who are dealing with dementia. Um, last year, Victoria had just noted that she she believes that we need a lot more intergenerational interaction, too, with those with dementia. And I would totally agree with that. Um, what, what are your thoughts about intergenerational interaction, Harry? You know, it, it's funny because I'm seeing, I'm seeing more young people becoming involved mm -hmm. and it, it's it's just it's heartwarming that uh that these well the young kids to me but these young people are getting involved in in uh in in nursing facilities and taking care of seniors and and things like that uh i think it i think it's a start i think it's a good start mm-hmm Wonderful. Any last wise words from you, Harry? Um, no, just keep your eyes open. Like, uh, report any abuse that you see. Now, you may be wrong, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, it's okay to report something that's not abuse. It's not okay to, to not report abuse. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, and we have to stop being fearful of getting involved. You know, that's yes. who we are as our core. Um, we're, we're, we're humans, and we should be involved um, in one another's lives and trying to protect and enhance, enhance lives, for sure. Now, if you're interested in getting um, a hold of Harry, he is on Facebook. So just, uh, just put in Harry Urban. And he will pop right up, or you can um, look for Forget Me Not on Facebook, too, and ask to be a member. You can also go to his blog, which is MyThoughtsOnDementia.com, MyThoughtsOnDementia.com. And, um, Harry, are you comfortable giving out your email, or do you want him just to go through those modes to reach no, him? That that's that's fine. That's oh, fine. Yeah. Okay, so it's Harry H A R R Y, and then an underscore Urban, and that's U R B A N at M S N dot com. Harry underscore Urban, that's U R B A N at M S N dot com. Well, again, thank you everybody for joining in the conversation. I really appreciate it very much, and. Harry, I so appreciate you taking time to be with us today. It was it was my pleasure, Roy. Now we only we only touched the tip of the iceberg, but you opened the door. Yep. And that's all we asked for. Yep. Oh, well, and we want this conversation to continue. That's for sure. So thank you again so much. Um, for for thank those you. of you that are new to the live and social network, uh, one of the other shows you might want to check out is. Rachel Perrin is a culinary director for Kowalski's Market, and uh, her, along with her producer and sidekick, Adam Lee, um, join, uh, you can join their show called Foodtastic, uh, friends and colleagues, and, um, and chat with them about seasonal flavors and favorite foods and 
trending topics um, regarding nutrition. And it's, it's neat because their podcast is, average is only about 10 to 15 minutes per episode, but it's really perfect if you're busy and yet hungry and want a little assistance making dinner plans. You can also go to kowalskis.com uh, to find lots of um, easy and delicious seasonal uh, menu suggestions, and that would just be kowalskis, K-O-W-A-L, S-K-I-S dot com and uh, check out those menus. Uh, for our latest shows here on the radio, if you missed them, you might want to go back to the podcast. We have years of them, but our most recent, we talked about the science behind Alzheimer's. We welcome, welcomed um, a state-of-the-art Alzheimer's care facility in Chicago, which I loved because their true state of the art was all relationship based, and I, I absolutely loved that. Um, they we also had um, a show on the transformation with the power of music, which is always close to my heart. Our last dementia chats, which is where we have a panelist of experts living with dementia, we discuss technology and apps. Do they help or do they hinder those living with dementia? It was a, a great great session. And our next session will be September 13th that you can join free. That's at 11 Eastern, 10 Central, 9 Mountain, 8 Pacific, and 4 o'clock if you're over in London. Our um, last Conscious Caring interview was with Scott Chapin, who is the, an entrepreneur in the senior care industry, and he is the co-founder of both caring, uh, caregivinganswers.com and Senior Providers Network, which uh, specializes in employee benefits focused on providing elder care assistance. Um, what else do we have here? On the blog, we had a really interesting article by Michael Ellenbogen talking about um, boating and dementia and the day his dreams sank. There is also an article about uh, Health Star Home Health, who is out at our Minnesota State Fair doing memory screenings. And just this last Monday, they had Dr. Sonia Mosh on, and uh, she was kind of asked the experts there. Um, and then don't forget, you know, if you're worried about your loved one possibly wandering, you may want to check out the Caregiver Alert Center. And you can go to alzheimerspeaks.com, go to our homepage, and you'll actually get a discount it's under $15 a year to protect your loved one and um, can really help if that emergency would, uh, would, um, would be needed. Uh, last year, I just want to remind you to uh, sign up if you'd like to be a member of Alzheimer Speaks. We do have free tools and, um, and services that you can tap into. Um, one of them is called Your Memory Chip, which teaches us to be, instead of task-oriented, to really be relationship-based. Are they safe? Are they happy? Are they pain-free? And you can sign up to be a member right on our main page. Until next week, have a great, great holiday, and we will talk soon. Bye, everyone. It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now, this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire. Become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.